Hi, Sea Road. Hi, Sea Road. Welcome. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us today. Somebody Joe and I are watching from the pond here, and we're catching <laughs> some frogs. Oh my goodness. So okay, goes, frog. This frog just jumped off, and then he got him because I pushed him in. <laughs> okay, so you know about frogs. Can you tell them about a little bit about frogs? Okay, frogs. I'm saying kill the frog for the catch on their feet. Okay, what do you know about them? Um, frogs, they, they um, eat mosquitoes and they, and they jump very hard. Okay, and, and, they, and they have a tongue very long, a very long time. Well, there you have it, our frog expert today. Thanks again for watching with us and we'll see you a little bit later. Enjoy! Joy.
give you glory for all you brought me through and now i'm ready for whatever you want to do i'm moving forward to follow after you and now i'm ready for whatever you Your presence is an open door So I want you, Lord, like never before Your presence is an open door So come now, Lord, like never Every season, your grace has been enough, and I'm believing the best is yet to come. The cross before me, my hope on things above, and in you, Jesus, the best is yet to come. Your presence is an open door We want you, Lord, like never before Your presence is an open door So come now, Lord, like never before
Welcome to week number two of the James Variant. Yes, we named it the James Variant. I know with all this news about variants and just all that negative press, why would we name this series the James Variant? Well, this is the variant we want you to catch. This is the one we want you to be exposed to. This is the one we want you to be infected by because the James Variant based out of scripture is something that can yield a positive effect in our lives. Now when I think of variance I also think of uniqueness, what is different, and I think of my teenage years wanting to express my variance, my uniqueness, my personal style. And that came pretty easy to me because I was the son of Dutch immigrants and yes I own some wooden shoes. Now, they weren't uh, completely wood, it was a clog actually, where you had the wooden base with the leather upper. And uh, I would wear those things to express my variance, my uniqueness, specifically on Friday nights to youth group, sometimes with my overalls. And you know what? My girlfriend hated it. Her name was Julie. Thankfully, it didn't dissuade her from marrying me. Uh, this summer we'll be married 35 years. But she thought I looked like such a dork. She couldn't believe that I would wear that. Hey, listen, why don't you write in the comments below what your is, uh, what's your variant? What makes you unique? Maybe it's something about your personal style. Perhaps we'll have a chuckle. We can laugh with you or even laugh at you. 
Come on, it's fair. I just told you my story, right? Well, I uh, want to read today from Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible, of the message. It's very modern English, and he really helps us get a good uh, handle on what James, in this case, was dealing with in first century Israel. Now, Eugene Peterson also writes introductions to each of the books. And I want to read just a little bit of what he wrote to set up the book of James. It's this. Just as a hospital collects the sick under one roof and labels them as such, the church collects sinners. Many of the people outside the hospital are every bit as sick as the ones inside, but their illnesses are either undiagnosed or disguised. It's similar with sinners outside the church. So Christian churches are not, as a rule, model communities of good behavior. Ouch, that one hurts. They are rather places where human misbehavior is brought out in the open, faced, and dealt with. And then later on, Eugene says this, Wisdom is not primarily knowing the truth, although it certainly includes that. It is skill in living. For what good is a truth if we don't know how to live it? And this, folks, is why church community is important. People gathering together to live life together. So today we are in James chapter 2. Uh, as I said, very modern English, but it really helps you get the gist of what James is dealing with. Uh, let's read verses 1 to 10. My dear friends, don't let public opinion influence how you live out our glorious Christ-originated faith. If a man enters your church wearing an expensive suit, and a street person wearing rags comes in right after him, and you say to the man in the suit, Sit here, sir, this is the best seat in the house, and either ignore the street person or say, Better sit here in the back row, haven't you segregated God's children? and proved that you are judges that can't be trusted? Listen, dear friends, isn't it clear by now that God operates quite differently? He chose the world's down and outs as the kingdom's first citizens with full rights and privileges. This kingdom is promised to anyone who loves God. And here you are abusing these same citizens. Isn't it the high and mighty who exploit you? who use the courts to rob you blind? Aren't they the ones who scorn the new name Christian used in your baptisms? You do well when you complete the royal rule of the scriptures. Love others as you love yourself. But if you play up to these so-called important people, you go against the rule and you stand convicted by it. You can't pick and choose in these things, specializing in keeping one or two things in God's law and ignoring others. I'll tell you, some scripture is so easy to understand. I get it, there's a pile of scripture that's hard to comprehend, but there are plenty of scriptures that are very easy to understand. Problem is we just don't follow them. Fact is I saw a uh, meme on Facebook uh, last week that said this, some things don't need prayer, they need discipline. God already told you what to do, you're just procrastinating. I thought it was clever, thought it was funny, painfully true. Thank you, Julie Lynn, for sharing that one. I appreciated it. Fact is, whether we're in the 21st century or the first century, people need correction. They need encouragement. They need guidance. And the James variant, the variant that James wanted to share with his people was do the royal rule love others as you love yourself. And when you practice that, it actually protects you from negative things. Now, what James was dealing with in the first century was favoritism. People were showing favoritism for the rich over the poor. I'm thinking of some of the negative isms that plague our culture. Ageism, preferring one age group over another. Sexism, preferring one gender over the other. Uh, racism, showing prejudice to one race over another. The royal rule actually protects us from those negative isms and it's God's remedy for a hurting world. So let's read on verses 14 to 17. James, uh, he kind of switches gears and talks about faith in action here. He says, dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? 
Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half-starved and say, Good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then walk off without providing so much as a, cu a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? You know, we know that to be true. We call it hypocrisy. If your faith does not affect the way you treat your spouse, for instance, then it's useless. If your faith doesn't positively change the way you deal with your children, with co-workers, employer, employee, fellow students, whatever, then that faith is useless. James even says it's dead. If your faith doesn't bless others, it's useless. We need to have a faith that so infects us that we infect others in a positive way. Helping people. Now, you know, here at Sea Road, we give all kinds of opportunity to help people. We um, are advertising for the Brockville Food Bank. You know, they need drivers right now. That is one way you can put your faith into action. We've talked about the Outpost Cafe in Prescott. There is one way you can put faith into action by helping out there. A couple weeks ago, we sponsored the TAP Effect, bringing uh, fresh drinking water to people in Cambodia. And we have this long-standing relationship with the people of Ghana, West Africa. You know, I want to insert some pictures here showing you how your generosity has blessed the people of Ghana. It's allowed them to build these desks and these chairs. And you know, later this summer, we will host uh, a yard sale right here at the church to raise more funds. So we will create opportunity over and over again for you to put your faith into action. Let's read on in verses 18 to 20. Well, I can already hear one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good, you take care of the faith department <laughs> and I'll handle the works department. Uh, not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith, fit together, hand in glove. Do I hear you professing to believe in the one and only God, but then observe you complacently sitting back as if you had something done wonderful? That's just great. Demons do that. But what good does it do them? Use your heads. Do you suppose for a minute that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? Faith and works, they belong together. And James is saying, just do it. And then he goes on and quotes this radical Old Testament example in verses 21 to 24. He says this, Wasn't our ancestor Abraham made right with God by works? when he placed his son Isaac on the sacrificial altar? Isn't it obvious that faith and works are yoked partners? That faith expresses itself in works? That the works are works of faith? The full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. It's that mesh of believing and acting that got Abraham named God's friend. Is it not evident that a person is made right with God, not by a barren faith, but by faith fruitful and works? Now, I know James is quoting a very radical example here, uh, one where God instructed Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Human sacrifice was reprehensible. In fact, God spoke against it. He spoke against cultures who practiced human sacrifice. So then why right here in Judeo-Christian literature do we have an example of God uh, instructing Abraham to do that? It seems inconsistent. What gives? Well, you know, when James was sharing this with his uh, readers, people dispersed throughout Israel, they had this common understanding that we can see one book back in the book of Hebrews, verses, or chapter 11, verses 17 to 19. This would be a commonly um, understood concept to his audience. By faith, 
Abraham, at the time of testing, offered Isaac back to God. Acting in faith, he was as ready to return the promised son, his only son, as he had been to receive him. And this, after he had already been told, your descendants shall come from Isaac. Abraham figured that if God wanted to, he could raise the dead. And in a sense, that's what happened when he received Isaac back alive from off the altar. So we know that God didn't let him go through with it. Rather, Abe's faith and action led to a amazing revelation. Abraham, I can only imagine, as he pondered God's instruction to sacrifice his son, was had to figure it out, like, how can this be? Everything that Abraham knew about God through their history together, through the promises that God gave him, through God's very character, didn't line up with sacrificing his son. And so what conclusion did Abraham come to? Not that God was inconsistent or hypocritical or mean, but rather the revelation of resurrection. Abraham reasoned, Abraham figured out that if God wanted to, he could raise Isaac from the dead. Now this would have been a brand new concept at that time in history. We know it to be so at our point in history, but not Abraham in his day. It was a new revelation. And so his faith and his action led to an amazing revelation. So I wonder if we were to link our faith with our actions. I wonder just what revelations God might give to us. What truth he might really cement in our lives. Now you might say, well Raj, that's great, I, that, would be, that would be wonderful, but I sure don't have the faith that Abraham does. I can't uh, have that big enough of a faith. I get that Abraham's faith was extreme, but look what James does. He quotes a second example. Abraham was this rich man, uh, probably not too many repercussions to his actions, and so <laughs> James quotes another example. It's equally extreme but at the other end of the spectrum. Verse 25, the same with Rahab, the Jericho harlot. Wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape that seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God? The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up with a corpse. Separate faith and works, and you get the same thing, a corpse. So James is quoting two very extreme examples here in the scriptures. Number one, the patriarch Abraham from Genesis chapter 22. We've got this man who's rich. He has shepherds. He has sheep. He has flocks. He has servants. He has privilege and influence. No repercussions to his behavior. He's got all kinds of privilege. And then example number two, Rahab the prostitute. Here she is, a victimized woman, impoverished, suffering. James quotes these two examples that are couldn't be more opposite. And what's he saying? It doesn't matter where you are in your social standing. What matters is faith expressing itself through action. And the fact is God had declared both of these people righteous because they expressed their faith through action. So I ask you, where are you on that spectrum? Maybe you relate a little more uh, towards Abraham's end. Maybe you have some means. Uh, maybe you have some riches. Maybe you have some privilege and influence. And you can identify more to this end of the spectrum. Or maybe you identify a little more with Rahab's end of the spectrum. Maybe you're feeling victimized over something, or perhaps you are impoverished. What James is saying is this, wherever you are on the spectrum, at polar opposites or anywhere in between, what matters is faith expressing itself through action. And what intrigues me is this, this example that James uses at the end of chapter two kind of reflects the concept he, dis he discloses at the beginning of chapter 2. We've got rich Abraham and poor Rahab. Well, the beginning of chapter 2, he's talking about people showing favoritism for the rich over the poor. 
And so if we are to exercise that royal rule to love others as ourselves, it doesn't matter where we are on that spectrum, doesn't matter um, where we are in, in life, do not show favoritism whether it's expressed in ageism or sexism or racism or some type of social standing, the royal rule will protect you from it. So I'm gonna ask you to open up your heart and, and say to God, Lord, if there is anything in my life that I am showing some type of prejudice in my actions, either in the people I choose to hang out with or uh, even, even consider talking to, um, lay it before the Lord and ask him to uncover it. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I ask that you help us put our faith into action by exercising that royal rule. We know, Lord, that our hearts can be deceptive. And so if there's anything about the way we operate in um, how we treat the other gender, how we treat other races, Lord, how we treat other age groups or other social strata, Lord, would you put your finger on us and, and open up our hearts to express that royal rule that we would love all others as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now I'm going to ask you to uh, continue doing business with Jesus as our worship team leads us in this next song. Have a great week.
Hey guys! Welcome hey back! Guys. So we're just here and we continue to frog catch. How many did we catch? Six. Six! We caught six of them. And so what are we going to do with them? We're going to put them back in and then after put them back in their nature. Alright, alright, cool. Well, somebody who loves animals and he has always wanted a pet, but we're not sure okay. what pet, what kind of pet do you think you should get? Oh, we got one. Here's that one right now. Oh. <laughs> what kind of pet do you want, Samuel? What kind of pet? <laughs> Not you. What kind of pet do you want, buddy? What kind of pet do you want, babe? I want to have a frog with the frog is red. Oh, he wants to have a frog, maybe an aquarium or something. If you guys have a pet that you love, let us know what it is in the comments. We'd love to know what kind of pets you have and love, maybe what their name is. But we just want to send you into your week with some good news. We've got a few things that we are so excited about. The first one is, is we have a community podcast. And so this is hosted by Pastor Jason. And we're starting a five-week series of podcasts about conversations about the book James. And so this is our first week, so check it out on our website. Um, this week starts off with one of our board members, Heather Corner, and so it's an opportunity for you to get to know some of our C-Road community and see the ways in which God is working in their lives. So tune into the community podcast. You can go to our website. Also, don't forget to go to our Facebook page for kids and for you. We've got a whole lot of things coming your way this summer and we want you to stay informed and check out these really fun opportunities and some ways that we've been inspiring hope. So one of them is every Sunday at 10.15, we are Sea Road Kids Live. So if you go to the Facebook page, you can tune in there. We've got all sorts of really great um, opportunities for your kids to engage with who God is and how he continually shows himself in our life. Also for you, we have an escape room this Wednesday. It's called Escape Your Phones. You don't want to miss that. You can go to the Facebook page, CYM Facebook page. And we have some adventures to celebrate. This is quite the adventure here with these frogs right here. But we've got some adventures to celebrate. Pastor Roger and Julie are heading to Nova Scotia and Pastor Justin and Pastor Hannah are heading to New York on their next adventure. And so we want to celebrate all that God has done in their time here at Sea Road. And so keep your eye on our no. socials, Instagram and Facebook, so that we can let you know how you can come and show your support and celebrate the next adventure in their journey. All right, guys, have a great week.